Tonight's lecture focuses on the centuries that separate Prophet Jesus from Prophet Muhammad. Specifically, we will look at four primary issues, the interpretation of which divides contemporary Christianity from Islam. These four issues are the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion event, the nature of Jesus, and the nature of God. In reviewing these four issues, each issue will be examined in turn and where appropriate will be traced along chronological trajectories. However, before beginning this endeavor, it should be noted that contrary to popular belief, early Christianity was not a single monolithic structure. There were many branches to early Christianity and each local church, for example, the church at Corinth, the church at Jerusalem, was independent of every other church. Each church had its own ecclesiastical hierarchy and its own set of recognized scripture. Thus the letter of Barnabas was recognized as scripture by the church at Alexandria, Egypt, but not by other churches. Some churches recognized the gospel of Thomas and the shepherd of Hermas, and other churches did not. In that regard, it should be noted that most of the apocryphal books that I'll be referencing later in the lecture were recognized as authoritative by one or another of the early Christian churches. And in fact, it was not until the sixth century that the books of the New Testament became almost completely standardized, although attempts at standardization had begun about two centuries before that and although the East Syrian or Nestorian Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and the Coptic Church to this day have different New Testaments than the rest of Christianity and from each other. Well, not only did the local churches differ as to what was and was not considered scripture, they also differed as to doctrine and dogma. And such differences were especially apparent when we consider the four issues under consideration this evening. Now it's quite outside of current time parameters to cover all of the different positions advanced by one or another early branch of Christianity with regard to each of these four issues. Quite simply, it is not the intent of tonight's lecture to present the full range of opinion that existed within early Christianity, but only to highlight those early branches of Christianity that were more or less consistent with Islam's position on the four issues under consideration. Quran 3 verse 49 informs the reader that Jesus was appointed by God as a messenger to the children of Israel. In contrast, contemporary Christianity typically maintains that Jesus' mission and ministry were to the world at large. Nonetheless, there are several New Testament passages that appear to agree with the Islamic position that he was sent only to the children of Israel. For example, consider the following biblical verses. These twelve, that is the twelve disciples, these twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, verses 5 through 6. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. 
Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus reportedly said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, we might also consider how the actual disciples of Jesus, as well as their immediate followers, continued Jesus' ministry after the end of his earthly sojourn. However, at this point, we must interject a very important proviso that is often overlooked, even though known, by most contemporary Christians. Namely, that Paul, a former Pharisee and rabbi, once known as Saul of Tarsus, was never a disciple of Jesus, and apparently never even met Jesus during the latter's earthly ministry. In short, Paul, who was the foremost proponent of this concept of a universal ministry for Jesus, does not represent the tradition of the disciples of Jesus, and in fact was frequently in marked conflict with the Jerusalem church, which was the headquarters of the disciples of Jesus. And this can be readily substantiated by turning to the New Testament. When he, that is Paul, had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Other New Testament passages, for example, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 26, and Galatians 2, verses 1 through 9, dramatically illustrate that Paul, with his insistence on preaching to the Gentiles, was in frequent conflict with the Jerusalem church. Now, with regard to these three passages, it's instructive to note that Acts and Galatians are Pauline documents and do not reflect the teachings of the Jerusalem church and of the actual disciples of Jesus. As an illustration of this Pauline bias, one can profitably examine Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 26, where the Pauline writer of this text attempts to show that the Jerusalem church supported Paul and Neo. However, the fact of the matter was, as recorded in that very passage, the elders of the Jerusalem church made Paul undergo the temporary rites of being a Nazarite, meaning that he was made to purify himself and to pay penance for what he had been doing. Well, despite this Pauline bias, Acts does preserve a statement indicating what the actual disciples of Jesus and their immediate followers did when it came to preaching the message of Jesus. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And they spoke the word to no one except Jews. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. In short, any serious student of early Christianity must recognize a fundamental divergence of thought between the Pauline church with its message to the Gentiles and the Jerusalem church of Jesus' actual disciples. The latter restricted its message to the children of Israel, continued to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, and did not even call themselves Christians, a term that first arose in the Gentile church in Antioch, as witnessed by Acts chapter 11, verses 20 through 26. Now, many scholars of early Christianity, recognizing that the actual disciples of Jesus did not preach to other than the children of Israel, refer to the Jerusalem church as being Jewish Christian. This Jewish Christian tradition continued even after the destruction of the temple in the year 70. Such early Christian movements as the Ibionites, 
the Nazarenes and the Elkasites represent this Jewish Christian tradition. In particular, we can point to the Ibionites, a group that was established around the year 70, about the time of the destruction of the temple. And then they fled from the vicinity of Jerusalem and spread to what is today Jordan, Syria, Turkey, and Egypt. Of note, the Ibionites continued as a viable movement within greater Christianity throughout the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries CE. Likewise, the Nazarenes were known to have existed in greater Syria at least as late as the 4th century CE. Both groups, Jewish Christian. While reviewing the preceding historical record, one finds evidence of a trajectory within early Christianity that can be traced back to the biblical books of Matthew and Acts and the Jerusalem church and that continued to exist well into at least the 4th century CE and that continued to restrict active preaching to the children of Israel. Of note, the groups represented by this longitudinal trajectory also firmly rejected the Pauline abrogation of the so-called Mosaic laws governing dietary restrictions, etc. In this way, these groups were also more or less consistent with Islam. Any student of comparative religion knows that there are major similarities in the understanding of Jesus and Mary by Islam and early Christianity. However, when we consider the crucifixion event, we come to a fundamental discrepancy between Islam and modern Christianity. The Quran declares that Jesus was not crucified, even though his persecutors thought that they had crucified him. That they said and boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not. No, God raised him up unto himself. And God is exalted in power wise. Quran chapter 4 verses 157 to 158. The Quran says that Jesus was not crucified, a position in marked conflict with contemporary Christianity. Instead, God raised Jesus up unto himself, a statement having parallels with the ascension of Jesus as portrayed in the biblical gospels of Mark and Luke. Now for most contemporary Christians, indeed for most inhabitants of the Western world, it is almost unthinkable that anyone could seriously maintain that Jesus was not crucified. Such critics of Islam might even maintain that the alleged resurrection of Jesus is a matter of personal religious belief, but the crucifixion of Jesus is a matter of an unblemished historical record. However, as we shall soon see, the actual historical record is otherwise than we might expect. Outside of the New Testament and other early Jewish and Christian scriptural writings, there are only two references to Jesus being crucified in the entire historical record of the first and early second centuries. The first was made by Josephus ben Matthias, a first century Jewish historian the second by Tacitus, a first and second century Roman. Neither writer was present at the crucifixion event. For that matter, most biblical scholars maintain that none of the New Testament authors who wrote about the crucifixion event were present at it. Nonetheless, the skeptic of the Islamic position that Jesus was not crucified will rightly insist that any serious attempt to refute the crucifixion of Jesus must marshal an impressive array of documentation 
that there was serious controversy about whether or not Jesus was crucified. Where is that documentation? They may well ask. The answer is that it is to be found within the writings of early Christianity itself. In short, the discrepancy about the crucifixion event between Islam and contemporary Christianity obscures the fact that many branches of early Christianity maintain quite adamantly that it was not Jesus Christ who was crucified. This can be verified by examining the writings of the so-called apostolic fathers of early Christianity, the so-called New Testament Apocrypha, and yes, even the New Testament itself. The writings of the Apostolic Fathers frequently noted that there were Christian groups that rejected the proposition that Jesus had been crucified. Such references can be found in the writings of Ignatius, Polycarp, Justin, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Hippolytus. Together, these Apostolic Fathers represent a veritable who's who of early Christianity. As a specific example, we can turn to the Trallians, a book authored by Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, who died around the year 110. In referring to the crucifixion event, Ignatius wrote that there were Christians of his day who denied that Jesus was crucified in reality, but was crucified only in appearance or in illusion. Now in considering this statement from Ignatius, one has to first of all acknowledge the fact that Ignatius couldn't be attacking a belief that wasn't already present. So we have documentation that there were Christians who did not believe that Jesus was crucified at least as early as the year 110. But also the very fact that Ignatius bothered to attack these groups suggests that that belief structure, that it was not Jesus who was crucified, was fairly widespread by at least 110. Well, the fact that many branches of early Christianity maintain that it was not Jesus who was crucified can also be readily verified by considering the so-called New Testament Apocrypha. For example, the Apocalypse of Peter, 81 through 82, maintained that Jesus was crucified only in appearance, not in reality, with the one who was crucified being a substitute or simulacrum of Jesus. Likewise, the second treatise of the great Seth, 55 through 56, stated that it was not Jesus who was crucified, but Simon, presumably Simon of Cyrene, who is identified in the biblical gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as having been the person who carried Christ's cross for him. Seth goes on to state that Simon appeared as though he were Jesus. Now this position, that it was Simon of Cyrene who was crucified in place of Jesus, was a cardinal tenet of that early Christian group known as Basilideans, which flourished in Egypt during the early second century and which claimed to have received its message directly from Glaucus, the translator of Simon Peter, one of the 12 disciples. Additionally, the Acts of John 97 through 101 reported that the crucifixion of Jesus was an illusion. However, it's not just within these so-called apocryphal writings the one finds evidence that, that it was not Jesus who was crucified. The biblical gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 11 through 26, gives us a most important story of Jesus having been arrested and brought before Pontius Pilate for sentencing, sentencing and trial. And Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea, we're told in the story, really didn't want to condemn Jesus. So he offered the crowd a choice between two prisoners. He said, take your choice. 
I'll release the one that you want, the other one I'm going to crucify. Now, in most versions of the Bible, as you pick it up today, what you'll find is something like this. And Pilate said to the crowd, Whom do you wish that I release unto you? Jesus, who is called the Messiah, or Barabbas? And the crowd said, Give us Barabbas. And Barabbas was released. And Jesus, who was called the Messiah, was taken away and crucified. Unfortunately, those translations of the Bible do not go back to the earliest Greek manuscripts that exist. The only version of the Bible so far that has dared to go back to the earliest Greek manuscript is the New Revised Standard Version. And going back to those earliest Greek manuscripts, we find there is a crucial one word difference. So let me share that with you. And Pilate says to the crowd, whom do you wish that I release unto you? Jesus who is called the Messiah or Jesus Barabbas? Whoops, wait. We have two men with the same name. In Hebrew, Yeshua. Everywhere else in the Bible, it's translated as Joshua. Two men with the same name. So who's who? Well, maybe we can figure that out by looking at two key words in the passage. One word is Messiah, and the other is Barabbas. Now, Messiah, or Mashiach in Hebrew, simply means the anointed. That's all it means. If you look through the pages of the Old Testament, you'll find numerous individuals being referred to as the anointed, or Messiah. So who were the Messiahs of ancient Israel and of ancient Judaism? Three groups, basically. Sometimes prophets, the high priests of Judaism. Well, we know this Jesus wasn't the high priest of Judaism because we have the list of the high priests from Josephus and he's not on it. Third group would be someone claiming to be king of Israel, which if you're claiming to be king of Israel at that time and place means you're going to have to lead a rebellion against Rome, which is a capital offense, the punishment for which is crucifixion. And bear in mind that we're told in the Gospels that Pilate had nailed to the cross king of the Jews. So that's Messiah. Barabbas. Barabbas is not a name. Barabbas is a patronymic. You know, like Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him, Ibn Abdullah is a patronymic, the son of Abdullah. In Aramaic, Bar means the son of. So we have Jesus, the son of Abbas. But we're still not done. Because Abbas is not a name. Abbas is an Aramaic noun that needs to be translated. And so far, none of the biblical translators are willing to put it into the Bible per se. But if you look in any good Bible commentary, you'll find this. So let me repeat what Pilate said to the crowd, and I'm going to go ahead and make the translation for you. And Pilate said, Whom do you wish that I release unto you? Jesus, who is called the Messiah, or Jesus, the Son of the Father? And the crowd said, Give us the son of the father. And Pilate released him. And the other Jesus, the one whose sign on the cross said, King of the Jews, he was taken away and crucified. Does this perhaps help explain why the Coptic church canonized Pontius Pilate as a saint? Does one justify sainthood for the man who crucified Jesus or for the man who released him? However, if Jesus was not crucified, what does this say about the Christian doctrine of the atonement in the blood? That is, forgiveness of sins based upon Christ's alleged crucifixion. After all, was not the crucifixion of Jesus the crowning pinnacle of his divine mission? Was it not an absolutely indispensable part 
of his divine work. Well, what did Jesus himself reportedly say about this? His answer appears to be reported in a prayer attributed to Jesus in the biblical Gospel of John. Of note, John places this prayer prior to the crucifixion event. And let me quote from that prayer. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. John 17 verses 3 through 4. I finished the work that you gave me to do and did so prior to any crucifixion event. As reported by John, Jesus specifically excluded the later crucifixion event as being part of his work that you gave me to do. In summary, I think it's pretty clear that there were branches of early Christianity that, like Islam, maintain that Jesus was not crucified. Whether or not contemporary Christians begin to rethink their own belief in the crucifixion of Jesus, it is hoped that they will have a more tolerant understanding of how it is that Islam can maintain that Jesus was not crucified. Islam holds that Jesus was a man, but one who was selected by God to be a prophet and messenger. Despite Islam's adherence to the virgin birth of Jesus, Islam maintains that Jesus was created by God, not begotten by him. Say, he is God the one and only, God the eternal absolute. He begets not nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. Quran 112. She, that is Mary, said, O oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? He, the angel, said, Even so, God creates what he wills. When he has decreed a plan, he but says to it, Be, and it is. The similitude of Jesus before God is as that of Adam. He created him from dust, then said to him, Be, and he was. Quran 3, verses 47 and 59. When considering the issue of the nature of Jesus within early Christianity, one is immediately confronted with the major differences that existed among the various early Christian churches. At the risk of oversimplifying, the ways in which early Christianity answered the question of the nature of Jesus can be grouped into three broad categories. Jesus was God. Jesus was God and man simultaneously. And Jesus was a man, although one who was an instrument of God. Now the first position, that Jesus was God, denies the humanity of Jesus. This position was represented in early Christianity by many forms of Christian Gnosticism, especially by Docetism. The Docetist position was that Jesus did not have a real or material body, but only a phantom or apparent body. As such, the Docetists maintained that Jesus could not have suffered and died on the cross because he didn't have a physical body. Likewise, because he had no physical body, there could have been no resurrection. The second position, that Jesus was both God and man simultaneously, is the one that evolved into the typical and orthodox doctrines of contemporary Christianity. You have both divinity and humanity, and according to the creedal formula, those two natures are neither mixed nor separated. Figure that one out. The third position, that Jesus was a man, although one standing in a special relationship with God, 
is represented in early Christianity by the various adoptionist theologies, including that of the Ibionites, dynamic monarchianism, Arianism, Nestorianism, the Paulicians of Armenia, etc. These early Christian movements basically maintained that Jesus' relationship to God was like that of an adopted son, not like a begotten son. Now, this position is more or less consistent with Islamic thought, which views Jesus as being a man, albeit as a man who was a prophet and messenger of God and thus stood in a special relationship with God. The adoptionist trajectory in early Christianity begins with the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, peace be upon him. According to most adoptionists, it was at this moment that Jesus moved into his special relationship with God. Not at his conception, not at his birth. With regard to the baptism of Jesus, the account in the Gospel of Luke is especially relevant. As noted in appropriate footnotes to the Revised Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The oldest Greek manuscripts of and quotations from Luke render the key verse in question as follows. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Luke 3, verses 21 through 22. Today I have begotten you. That is at the time of the baptism, not at the time of conception. Now, given that Jesus was clearly an adult at the time of his baptism, under this ancient reading of Luke, begotten must be understood metaphorically, not physically, not literally. In other words, the sonship of Jesus was a created relationship, not a begotten relationship. Furthermore, before the contemporary Christian rejects this probably original wording of Luke 3.22, he or she should consider that this exact same wording is also to be found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, Hebrews 5, verse 5, and Acts 13, verse 33, in what are obvious references to the baptism of Jesus. The same wording can also be found in Psalms 2, verse 7, in reference to David, peace be upon him, and in the Gospel of the Ibionites. Well, given this scriptural legacy... It's not surprising that adoptionism was a potent force within early Christianity from the first through the seventh centuries. In fact, one can trace the chronological trajectory of adoptionism with some precision. As early as the first century, the adoptionist position was a key doctrine of the Ibionites who maintained that Jesus became the Messiah and adopted Son of God at his baptism and that this was secondary to Jesus having obeyed the Mosaic law. As noted previously, the Ibionites continued as a force in early Christianity well into the fourth century. Around 160 to 170 CE, Theodotus the Gnostic preached a Gnostic version of adoptionist theory throughout Turkey. Influenced by Valentinus, Theodotus taught that Jesus was a man who was created by God and who was united with God in a special relationship at the baptism in order to bring knowledge to man. Around 189 CE, Theodotus the Tanner traveled from Byzantium to Rome where he propounded an adoptionist position that maintained that Jesus was a mere man, although miraculously conceived. According to this Theodotus, Jesus was the metaphorical Son of God only to the extent that God granted him divine wisdom and power at his baptism. 
Despite being excommunicated by Pope Victor I, Theodotus acquired numerous followers who continued his adoptionist preaching, which began to be known as Theodosianism or dynamic monarchianism. This movement lasted well into the third century, being supported by Artemon of Rome, among others. Around 260 CE, Paul of Samosata, the bishop of Antioch, mind you, the bishop, advanced the adoptionist position once again. Paul held that Jesus was a man who was born of Mary, through whom God spoke his word, and that Jesus was divine only to the extent that he was the human vehicle through whom God spoke. As a result of Paul's preaching this adoptionist doctrine, at least three different church councils were held at Antioch to debate his orthodoxy. The first two cleared him of any wrong. Rather amazingly, it was only after the third council in 268 CE that Paul was pronounced deposed from his episcopacy. Nonetheless, it took an additional four years to depose him. In fact, thanks to the help that he received from Zenobia, the queen of Palmyra. Despite having been finally deposed, Paul's adoptionist message was picked up by his followers who later evolved into the Paulicians of Armenia, a Christian movement active as late as the seventh century CE. Well, a half century later, the adoptionist position in early Christianity reached its zenith under the teachings of Arius. Arius had been born around 250 CE in Libya, was ordained into the priesthood, and became a presbyter at Alexandria, Egypt. His adoptionist teachings were often uncannily in line with later Islamic teachings on the nature of Jesus and on the nature of God. For example, Arius taught that God is absolutely unique and incomparable, is alone, self-existent, unchangeable, and infinite, and must be understood in terms of his absolute oneness. Now, given this all-important first premise, Arius concluded that, one, the life of Jesus as portrayed in the biblical gospels demonstrates that Jesus was not self-existent, that he changed and grew over time, if in no other way than in passing through the stages of birth, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, and that he was finite, having a definite time of conception and birth. Therefore, two, Jesus was God's created being who was called into existence out of nothingness, who could not have shared in the absolute uniqueness, immutability, and infinity of the Godhead without compromising them, who could not have been of the same substance of God without compromising the oneness of God, and who could have had no direct knowledge of God other than that which God chose to reveal to him. Well, Arianism was first publicized about 323 in Arius's poetic work Thalia, and quickly grew in popularity, spreading throughout the Middle East with amazing rapidity, thanks in part to the many songs that popularized Arianism amongst the Christian laity. It was due to the rapid rise of Arianism that the Synod at Alexandria met in September of 323 and formally excommunicated Arius. Well, this excommunication was promptly reversed one month later at the Synod of Bithynia. Finally, Emperor Constantine was forced to convene the Council of Nicaea in May of 325 CE. And at that council, they formalized a doctrine that Jesus was of one substance with the Father. Arius refused to sign this creed and was thence branded as a heretic. However, the Arian position within Christianity was so strong that Constantine was forced to reinstate Arius at the Synod of Jerusalem in 335. Later that same year, Arius died at Constantinople. However, that was hardly the end of Arianism within early Christianity. 
Quite simply, despite the verdict of the Council of Nicaea, Arianism was probably the dominant Christology within 4th century Christianity. Many bishops had refused to attend the Council of Nicaea, and many others recanted their vote at Nicaea once they were safely back home, removed from Constantine's force of arms. As an example, one can turn to Eusebius of Nicomedia, who was successively the bishop of Veritus and Nicomedia. Eusebius vehemently rejected the doctrine that Jesus and God were of the same substance and led the Arian opposition at the Council of Nicaea before being forced to sign off on the creed under force of arms. Safely back home, he renewed his alliance <laughs> with Arius and was then exiled by Gaul, to Gaul by Constantine. However, even in exile, Eusebius continued to lead the Arian charge until his death around the year 342. However, the Council of Nicaea didn't solve anything. In response to the continued growth of Arianism, despite the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Antioch in the year 341 released a new creed that omitted any mention of Jesus and God being of the same substance. Furthermore, the Council of Sirmium in 357 actually endorsed the Arian position and stated that Jesus was unlike the Father or God. Only in 381 CE at the Second Council of Constantinople was the Arian position finally laid to rest and repudiated by the ecclesiastical structure of the church with the issuance of the so-called Nicene Creed. And by the way, I'm going to digress for a moment. This is a mistake almost all Muslims make and most Christians make. They think the Nicene Creed that said in worship service on Sunday morning was issued by the Council of Nicaea in 325. It was not. It was issued by the Second Council of Constantinople in the year 381. Well, notwithstanding this ecclesiastical dismissal of Arianism at the Second Council of Constantinople, Arianism continued to flourish in many Christian areas and was a potent force within some Germanic tribes until the end of the 7th century. Even today, Arianism continues to be influential in the Unitarian movement and among the Jehovah Witnesses. Well, by the late 4th century CE, adoptionism is still being represented by the Ibionites, the Paulicians of Armenia, and the Arians. However, the 5th century saw yet another adoptionist movement gain widespread support. Nestorius was born late in the 4th century at Maris, Turkey. He studied under Theodore, the bishop of Mopsuentia, entered the monastery at St. Eupripius, was ordained a priest, and became a celebrated thinker and theologian. In 428 CE, he became the bishop and patriarch of Constantinople, arguably the second highest position in all of Christianity, second only to the Pope. And the Greek Orthodox Church would say equal with the Pope. Well, on Christmas in 428, Nestorius began a series of sermons that were to rock Christendom. Among other things, Nestorius argued that the Virgin Mary should no longer continue to be called Theotokos. Literally translated, that means God-bearer, but it's usually translated as Mother of God. Nestorius maintained that the use of that title compromised the full humanity of Jesus, whom he appeared to see as a man who had been adopted by God. At the Council of Ephesus in 431, Nestorius' teachings were condemned and he was deposed from his episcopacy. He later died around 451 in Panopolis, Egypt. But despite his death, the adoptionist teachings of Nestorius continued to grow in influence, giving rise to Nestorian Christianity. As such, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 CE had once again 
to condemn Nestorius and his teachings. However, this condemnation did little good in suppressing the Nestorian position. Because in February of 486 CE, Barsimus, the Metropolitan of Nisibus, named Theodore of Mopsuentia, who was the chief Nestorian theologian, as the guardian of the right faith of the Persian church, which was independent of Rome. Theodore was confirmed in this position by the patriarch of the Persian church, and the Persian church became officially Nestorian. Preaching a doctrine that presents God or presents Jesus as a God-inspired prophet rather than as an incarnation of God. Nestorian Christianity continued to grow and flourish well into the 6th century. In fact, by the end of the 5th century, there were seven metropolitan provinces in Persia and several episcopacies in Arabia and India. During the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries, Nestorian Christianity continued to flourish in China. To this day, there are small pockets of Nestorian Christians to be found in Iraq, Syria, and Iran, although they appear to have lost touch with their Nestorian roots. In summary, early Christianity was quite conflicted about the issue of the nature of Jesus. The various adoptionist positions within early Christianity were numerous and at times dominant. One can even speculate that Arian and Nestorian Christianity might very well be a sizable force within Christianity today if it weren't for the fact that these two groups, which were located primarily in the Middle East and North Africa, that these two groups were so similar to Islamic teachings regarding the nature of Jesus that they quite naturally were absorbed into Islam beginning in the seventh century. Islam and contemporary Christianity also differ concerning the nature of God. Although several branches of early Christianity were in substantial agreement with the Islamic concept of a strict and uncompromising monotheism, with God being seen as one and indivisible. The Quran is most adamant in insisting on this oneness of God. O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of God anything but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of God, and his word, which he bestowed on Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in God and his messenger. Say not trinity desist it will be better for you for god is one god glory be to him far exalted is he above having a son to him belong all things in the heavens and on earth and enough is god as a disposer of affairs quran 4 verse 171 however and in contrast when we examine the christian concept of a triune Godhead, that is, of the Trinity. We find something that is totally foreign to both Judaism and Islam. There is no Islamic or Judaic equivalent to the notions of three persons in one substance. With regard to Judaism, the Shema of the Old Testament is quite clear in rejecting any concept of the deity other than the unity of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. In contrast to the Christian concept of the Son of God, Son with a capital S, Islam views Jesus as a resolute prophet of God. In contrast to the Christian concept of the Holy Spirit as the third person of one substance comprising a triune Godhead, Islam sees the Holy Spirit as being a title belonging to the angel Gabriel. However, it is not just Islam and Judaism that reject the traditional Christian formulation of the Trinity. The early Christian churches were quite divided with regard to the conceptualized nature of the Godhead. To a great extent, these intra-Christian differences were directly related 
to the intra-Christian differences that existed concerning the nature of Jesus. Thus, the Jesus as man proponents within early Christianity, for example, the Ibionites, dynamic monarchianism, Arianism, the Paulicians of Armenia, and Nestorianism, denied the concept of a Trinitarian Godhead and professed the unity of God of the Council of Nicaea. Arianism was probably the dominant Christology within 4th century Christianity. Many bishops had refused to attend the Council of Nicaea, and many others recanted and the humanity of a created and finite Jesus. In this regard, they were once again basically consistent with Islamic belief, which holds to a strict monotheism in proclaiming the oneness of God. As should be clear by now, the doctrine of the Trinity developed gradually over several centuries and not without substantial controversy and rejection. Throughout its first several centuries, early Christianity struggled to maintain a strict monotheistic outlook while still paying homage to God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. One solution represented by the various adoptionists was to subordinate Jesus to God. It was only with the Council of Nicaea in 325 that the doctrine that Jesus was of one substance with the Father began to be formulated in any real sense, although even at Nicaea, precious little was said about the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, as previously noted, there was little unity at Nicaea, and what there was occurred only under force of arms provided by Emperor Constantine. However, by the end of the fourth century CE, the traditional Trinitarian concept of Christianity was well on its way to being established as official doctrine. The Athanasian Creed of circa 500 states that the Godhead consists of una substantia tre personae, one substance, three persons. However, the controversy was still far from over. As Augustine noted in De Trinitate on the Trinity, our Greek friends have spoken of one essence and three substances, but the Latins of one essence or substance and three persons. Be that as it may, God willing, the above review has illustrated that the early Christian churches were in fundamental disagreement when it came to the issue of the nature of God. Those who stressed the unity of God via one or another of the subordinationist or adoptionist positions were generally consistent with the Islamic position of the oneness of God. In conclusion, the historical record is clear. Throughout the first several centuries of Christianity, one can trace an Islamic or near-Islamic trajectory through all four issues under consideration. As in all things, God knows best. May God guide us all, and may the blessings and mercy of God be Son, upon us. Son of God is a title that we find running all through the Old Testament. It was never meant to be taken literally, certainly never meant that someone was the begotten Son of God. Uh, within the pages of the Old Testament, we see David be referred to as the Son of God. We see uh, different Israelite uh, tribes being referred to as the sons of God. The Israelite people as a whole being referred to as the sons of God. And any righteous, pious man being referred to as the son of God. And that's all it meant. And if someone referred to someone else as the son of God, that man here is a good, righteous, and pious individual. No other implication to it. And that was well understood in first century Palestine. The problem occurs when Paul takes the message to the Gentiles in Asia Minor Palestine. For them, Son of God calls up images of the gods coming down from Mount Olympus and uh, impregnating uh, human women. This whole idea of Son of God underwent a, a tremendous transformation when uh, that concept was taken out of the Jewish context and put into the Gentile context of Asia Minor and Europe. 
Dead Sea Scrolls don't uh, tell us much about early Christianity because these are, are Jewish texts, not uh, early Christian texts. They do tell us a fair amount about uh, first uh, century Judaism. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of the Dead Sea Scrolls was the fact that uh, at least one sect, the, uh, the authors of the Dead Sea Scroll, uh, were expecting two messiahs to come. One a priestly messiah, and then followed by a kingly messiah. But again, the, the relevance of the Dead Sea Scrolls are more towards understanding the Old Testament. They give us some variant readings of different passages of the Old Testament most helpful in terms of understanding the context in which Jesus, peace be upon him, lived. But they don't tell us much at all about the early Christianity. With the exception that uh, looking at some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, we can see uh, teachings that uh, crop up again in, say, the Sermon on the Mount. I think most Christians uh, believe what they say they believe. I think we can take them at their word on that. Um, when it comes to the issue of the Trinity, however, uh, I, I think if you ask Christians what's, what's the Trinity, they'll say three persons and one substance. And if you try to get them to really explain it, uh, they'll have trouble. Uh, and probably drift off into what the church has formally condemned as heresy. But uh, they won't know it. Why do most Christians? Why do Christians hate Muslims? Many Christians do not hate Muslims. Uh, let's let's be fair. We have many good friends uh, among the the Christian faith. Uh, the official position of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, as stated in one of the documents released by the Second Vatican Council, is we recognize Islam as one of the paths to salvation. Uh, an enemy doesn't say that about you. So I, I think we can see many Christians as being our friends. Certainly the extreme Christian right is another matter. Uh, they tend to focus on Islam as, as being the enemy. But that's only one slice of Christianity. Well, it's generally believed that the, uh, the wise men were um, Magians or, or Zoroastrians. It came from maybe Persia. However, in all honesty, aside from the reference to them in the Gospel of Matthew, there's absolutely no historical record whatsoever that uh, a group came from the East at that time. Um, however, there is a record of something like that happening uh, around the, the birth of Nero, the Roman emperor. And what was the first part of your question again, brother? Uh, okay, okay. Um, Christian scholars say they know it. Um, they teach it. Uh, but they teach it to a select group of people. You know, the, the scholars uh, teach in seminaries and schools of theology. Uh, they don't stand behind a pulpit on Sunday morning and uh, say their uh, knowledge to the Christian laity. <laughs> Back in the early 1970s, uh, Psychology Today magazine did a very interesting study. They, they listed 10 fundamental beliefs of Christianity. And then they went and did a big survey. How many of these do you believe? Among the Christian laity, the average Christian layman believed just over seven of the 10. The average ordained minister believed just under four of the ten. Okay. That's the seminary education. You know, it's, it's like what I said about Barabbas. Yeah, you know, that's no secret. Why don't you know that? Uh, at least they do if they went to seminary. Uh, that's been taught for years. That, that it was Jesus bar Abbas, Jesus the son of the father who was released. That's known among the intellectual circles. Okay, well, let's stick with the Gospel of Barnabas first. <laughs> Muslim authors make extravagant claims for the Gospel of Barnabas. Amongst other things, they say it was recognized as scripture by the church at Alexandria, Egypt. They say that Irenaeus, Bishop Irenaeus, wrote glowingly about it in the first two centuries. 
that Jerome based his Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible on the Gospel of Barnabas. Sorry to say all of those claims are absolutely false. The Church of Alexandria, Egypt did not recognize a Gospel of Barnabas as scripture. It recognized the epistle of Barnabas as scripture. And Muslim authors are confusing these two different books. Likewise, Irenaeus never mentioned the Gospel of Barnabas, but he did mention glowingly the Epistle of Barnabas. So this confusion is going on. As for Jerome's Latin Vulgate, anyone with a passing familiarity with the Latin Vulgate and uh, with the Gospel of Barnabas as we have it today knows there's absolutely no connection whatsoever. There is no mention anywhere in Christian literature of a Gospel of Barnabas prior to the year 500. And then we have only the title appearing in the Galatian Decree, which is a list of books prohibited by the Roman Catholic Church. All we have is the title. We have no text whatsoever, just a title. And that's the first mention anywhere in the year 500. Now, whether the book we have today is the same as that book that was banned in the year 500 is very questionable. There's absolutely no way to confirm it. But the other thing I would point out to you, brother, if we look at the absolute provenance of the Gospel of Barnabas, we can only take it back a few centuries. Now, supposedly, a Father Moreno stole this book from the Vatican Library. This is the story we're told, right? And his whole provenance rests on this Father Moreno. Brother, if I were to give you a hadith, quote to you a hadith, in which you knew that one person in that isnad is a self-confessed thief, would you accept that hadith? No, we can't accept the provenance of the Gospel of Barnabas either any further back than about 300 years. Most likely it's a complete fake and forgery. We don't need it either. I mean, we really don't. Uh, well, there's more than enough legitimate Christian writings from the early times, from the New Testament itself, when we go back to the earliest sources. We don't need it at all. As to the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas was discovered in Nakamadi, Egypt in the 1940s. This is a fascinating book. Uh, it has some obvious later Gnostic interpolations uh, in it, or additions to it. But those are easy to spot. They're, they're very obvious. And if you throw out those Gnostic interpolations, what you have left is a Q source document. Now, in Bible scholarship, it's typically maintained that the, the first gospel that was written was Mark or Proto-Mark. And that both Matthew and Luke copied from Mark, but they also copied from another document that they both had which is called Q. And this is simply a list of sayings. You know, Jesus, peace be upon him, said, boom. Jesus, peace be upon him, said, boom. Uh, and Thomas, obviously, is, is a Q source document. And it gives us, uh, in places, perhaps some more original wording in some of those sayings uh, than we can find in Matthew and, and Luke. It also allows us to see that Mark uh, some of the passages that uh, we thought Matthew and Luke took from Mark may in fact have been taken from Q because there are some Q statements in Mark we now know because of Thomas. Okay, there's a question. I, I think it means um, the difference between the Injil and the teachings of Jesus. The question says, were the teachings of Jesus oral or was there something in writing in Christian belief? Well, the, the teachings of Jesus were, were oral, that much we know. Um, so certainly the teachings were oral. To what extent they were written down. Um, the thing that's important, I think, for, for Muslims to appreciate is that uh, we should not equate the Injil with the uh, Gospels of the New Testament. The Injil, for all intents and purposes, has been lost. 
Well, not all Jews do. Uh, there are some um, that do, uh, and there's a movement within uh, Judaism among some Jews to, to recognize Jesus as a prophet and even to recognize him as the Messiah. And these Jews say, well, there's no future Messiah yet to come. But I think the majority of Jews still would say he was not a prophet. Baptism is a, a um, ritual in Christianity in which a person is born anew, uh, washed clean of his sins. It's a, a one-time thing, typically, in most churches. Uh, and depending upon which church, it can be done by just sprinkling a little water on the head or in some churches, you've got to be fully immersed. There's an amazing similarity, actually, between uh, Sahih uh, Ahadith and traditional Christian understanding of the end of times. Uh, in both uh, religions, we uh, have Jesus returning, peace be upon it. We have Jesus slaying the Antichrist in both religions. We have Jesus establishing a, a a messianic rule in both uh, religions, uh, though in the Christian religion uh, it's thought that that rule will last for a thousand years. And in the uh, a Hadith, uh, we're told variously it will be seven years or forty years. In fact, the description of the messianic reign is a passage in, in Isaiah, in the Old Testament of the Bible, which most Christians believe refers to the Messianic reign. And it's this wonderful passage of juxtapositions where, you know, the lamb lies down with the lion and kids play with snakes and nobody harms anybody. And an extremely similar statement uh, can be found in uh, the Musnad of uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. No, uh, they, they were not rejecting... Uh, the idea that Jesus was crucified. They, they were accepting that. You know, I, I think most Christians read that passage and they read right over the words in it. Uh, the fact that Jesus said, uh, you know, I finished the work that you gave me to do. Most Christians just read right over that and, and don't even stop to think, hey, wait a minute. If the work's complete, then what about the crucifixion? Um, as to the second coming, uh, that's a second set of work. Okay, okay. In, in terms of, of that passage from Matthew, the issue is, was there a massive confusion of identity that took place? Because none of the writers about the crucifixion event were there. There's no eyewitness testimonial. So was, was there a mix-up in identity, given that we have two men named Jesus? Um, and, and that this was the uh, appearance uh, issue. Now, the Basilideans said, no, you know, it was Simon of Cyrene who was crucified, and they specifically say that he was made to appear as though he were Jesus. Well, first of all, we need to make a distinction. Not, not all Christians are, are all Christian churches. Uh, back uh, Zionism 100%. This is something that we see primarily in the extreme Christian right. And the reason we see it in the extreme Christian right is because the extreme Christian right holds on to a doctrine uh, called the rapture. Now, the concept of the rapture never existed anywhere in Christian thought or Christian writings prior to the 19th century. So it's a relatively new concept. Uh, the way it starts is a girl in Scotland, a young girl in Scotland, has a vision of people miraculously being lifted up into the sky, uh, just as uh, Jesus is descending to earth in the second coming. Well, Schofield uh, bought into this vision and uh, tied together his Schofield reference Bible to try and support this vision. And this idea that people will miraculously ascend into heaven as Jesus is, is coming down to earth is known as the rapture. 
but you know, only the very select few will be taken up. But the thing is, if you're taken up in the rapture, then you're going to miss Armageddon. You're going to miss the war. You're going to miss the pestilence. You're going to miss the plague. You know, you're going to be up there in heaven. While earth is... Ew. So, they want the rapture to come now. Right now. And they think they're going straight to heaven. However, according to their very idiosyncratic reading of the Bible, they believe that three things have to happen before the rapture. One, reestablishment of the kingdom of Israel. Okay, well, we can see that happening in the late 40s, right? Two, creation of a new Babylon. Oops. United States invasion of Iraq. Is that why the Christian right was so gung-ho for that one? And three, rebuilding of the Solomonic Temple, which means destruction of Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa. And this is why the extreme Christian right so rabidly backs uh, Zionism, because they want that temple built. And until that temple is built, they will be the best friends of Zionism. But they think as soon as that temple is built, they're going to be gathered up into the rapture, into heaven. Jesus will come back down to earth, and all those Jews will go to hell. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it is really a, a marriage of political convenience between the extreme Christian right and, and Zionism. I'll come up with that. Suffice it to say, there are numerous, numerous, numerous different Christian churches, and uh, each one has something unique in its belief structure. <laughs>